Okay, I want to get us started and preserve our time uh, for our guests. Uh, I'm David Tripp. Uh, welcome to Messy Conversations, um, our first Messy Conversation of the new year. And we're very excited. Uh, we've got um, Dr. John Conta from the uh, AU Seattle campus and uh, Genevieve Brewer uh, joining us for today's conversation on uh, mentoring Black youth. So it should be a terrific uh, conversation. And uh, moderating that will be our own uh, Nabi Subatran, um, who is, uh, you recognize as a longtime uh, work study for us with Messy Conversations. And we're really lucky to have her with us. A couple of quick announcements, and then I'm going to get out of the way. Um, this is our first Messy Conversation of the year. Um, and then next week is a holiday, uh, Martin Luther King uh, holiday. So we won't be meeting next Monday. Uh, the following Monday, the 22nd, uh, Clarence is going to lead us uh, with a variety of conversationalists in a conversation about DEI, real or myth. What's really going on with DEI? Um, so if you know Clarence, you know you want to be there. Um, and then the last uh, Monday of January, we'll be joined by uh, Kat Bell, and I believe also John Dunham. And uh, we're going to be talking about race and writing. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about that conversation. So we hope to see some of you back. And the last thing, I just mentioned this. I, I, don't, I try not to mention too many dates in a uh, messy conversation. But this is, for me, a big one. Tomorrow is the birthday of Rigoberta Minchu, um, who you know, won the Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize back in 1992 for her work with indigenous people and women in her home country of Guatemala, and has largely just been forgotten about uh, since that time. Um, but it's her birthday tomorrow. So if you don't know Rigoberta Menchu, uh, look her up and say happy birthday. Nabi, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. David. Again, everybody, hello. My name is Nabi Sipistan, and today I will be facilitating um, our message conversation called Mentoring Black Youth. I have the honor to introduce um, Dr. Conti and Jenny Yee. And so Dr. Conti, Dr. John Conti uh, has received his doctorate in counselor education and supervision from a grocery university, Washington, D.C. in 2013, and his master's degree in community counseling from University of Rochester in 2004. He's currently a core faculty in the clinical mental health counseling program here at Antioch University, Seattle. Dr. Conti is the association for Counselor Education and Supervision ACES 2023 Research Award winner for Western Association for Counselor Education and Supervision called WACES Region. He has interest in quantitative and qualitative research methodologies and mentoring. Some of his research work include international counseling and global mental health, trauma, counselors and training, self-efficacy, quality of life, lived experiences of resilience among immigrants, multicultural issues and intersectionality, ethics and substance abuse and abuse. He is a peer reviewed review board member with the Journal of Educators Online called GO as well and um, editorial board member for, of the Journal of Counselor Preparation Supervision and chair best graduate student paper award Com committee for the African Studies and Research Forum. Genevieve, um, Charlene, our other conversationalist, Genevieve, um, Charlene Labanya Brewa was born in 2013. She is currently a fifth grade student at Hall's Crossroads Elementary School. She's also an author who skillfully combines her ideas and research to create captivating stories. She enjoys writing a variety of genres and subjects and has seen uh, has a keen sense of humor. Um, she's highly skilled at effectively expressing herself through language. She 
aims to motivate children to explore creativity and unlock their potential uh, through the act of writing and publishing. Aside from her initial published book, The Night of the Soldiers, uh, she has also authored five additional unpublished books. They are called Within Reach of Freedom, Middle School Drama Series, The Attack on Tuesday, Where Our Heroes Lie, and The Wonders of the Periodic Table. Jenny Veed is a recipient of the 2023 Carson Scholars and has represented her school at 2023 Young Scholars Program, Pathways and System, at Villanova University in Philadelphia. She took part in two programs at her school where that they were specifically designed for girls, Girls on the Run and Girls Scout. In addition, Genevieve serves as a safety patrol captain, ensuring that students are aware of and adhere to classroom safety standards, as well as providing guidance on bus and crossing safety. Again, thank you, Dr. John Conti and Genevieve for joining us today. Um, I'll be giving the floor to you. Thank you very much, Navi, for and your team for that introduction. And uh, while I pull up the slides here, just want to make sure um, everything works right here. Uh, thank you. How's the slideshow? I'm able. Yeah, thank you. Great. And with that introduction, thank you. And I'll pass you know the mic to uh, Jennifer Rewood to take us through. Thank you so much, Navi, for that fantastic introduction. I'm truly grateful to Antioch University for, for providing me with this opportunity to discuss my book in today's messy conversation. And with that, it will take us to the next slide where Genevieve is going to talk about our book. And also, I'll be talking a little bit about my mentoring role along the process, but I would largely give Genevieve the opportunity to speak more. And um, as you know, mentoring, you know, sometimes you take the back seat. All right, Genevieve. The Night of the Soldiers is a historical <laughs> fiction narrative that I wrote and published in July, 2023. It sheds light on the widespread anti-Semitism that existed during World War II. The story takes place in Poland. It delves into the perspective of a young fictional Jewish girl, Melody Alders. Due to the widespread anti-Semitism during World War II, she and her family encountered challenges associated with their Jewish identity. Also, she has to deal with the pain of separating from her lifelong friend, Sandra Linska. As the reader delves further into the book, it will reveal more unleashed secrets about her family and the adventurous quest that lies before them. Thank you very much, Genevieve. And here, Genevieve is going to talk about mission and goals, about how she does uh, authorship and writing. My objective is to encourage children to have a better grasp of history through reading historical fiction and nonfiction stories. For example, reading about the past helps students develop empathy and compassion. It assists a child in seeing the similarities that exist just behind their differences. In my opinion, these narratives have the unique power to thoroughly submerge readers in the perspectives who generally lived through the events of being written about. When students start at an early age to read about diverse people, distant places, and historical events, they become more creative and open. My aim is to motivate children to, have, uh, ex to explore their creativity and unlock their full potential through the act of writing and publishing, to express the means of languages, creativity, creative writing allows children to express their thoughts, feelings, fantasies, and emotions. In addition to language skills, storytelling fosters the development of critical thinking, empathy, and creativity. 
This next slide is about some of the books, the unpublished books uh, uh, that Genevieve is, work, is working on right now, the tentative titles. And um, she has been able to, after the first book was published, The Night of the Soldiers, and uh, she went further to further expand her knowledge into writing. And uh, here they are. I'll let, you, I'll let Genevieve read them and talk a little bit, if she could, about them. As Nabi addressed, in addition to The Night of the Soldiers, I have written five other unpublished books with tentative titles. That includes The Within Reach of Freedom, the middle school drama series, The Attack on Tuesday, Where Our Heroes Lie, and The Wonder of the Periodic Table. So as we go further, you would hear how Genevieve would explore um, some of these books in, into details and also uh, detailing her experience. So my role here as a mentor is uh, more to provide the foundation upon which uh, Genevieve has been able to explore. And it's a magical experience, I have to say. I call it magical experience because in January of 2023, uh, I was... Um, you know, I had a conversation with uh, Genevieve earlier that year, and um, she said she loves to write books, and you know, she loves reading. Reading, of course, I know that, and uh, she wanted to go into writing. So I said, "Oh, okay," and so I created a moment of uh, the ability to um, to facilitate that with uh, a MacBook Air computer, a brand new MacBook Air computer. So at least you know, because I, I trusted her, I know she's going to do it. And that MacBook Air became the piece upon which all of this happened. A book published and five others written. So I kind of put this slide here to just kind of see my role and not necessarily reading from the slide, but to see, to give you the context of how it happened. And from that, I would pass you over to Nabi, I believe. Okay, I'm clicking, but the slide is not going. Ah, there it is, questions. And... Uh, Fully pass you over to Navi and her team. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Conte and Genevieve, for that information. It helped us kind of get to know more about uh, the mentorship relationship that you and Genevieve has, and at the same time, hear about Genevieve's other work and um, how her mind works in terms of uh, the work she has done. Um, Genevieve, one of the questions I have, um, you know, as I introduced you, I'm aware that. Uh, you were born in 2023, and the book that you have written about um, is uh, there's context about World War II. And so I'm curious about how did you create characters for an event when you weren't even born yet? That is a very interesting question. In order to create characters for a book, I'll thoroughly do my research on the topics I plan to write about examine the events of that era, and analyze the viewpoints of the individuals who experienced them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate you um, for, uh, for giving us context as to how that, how that works for you. Um, again, I'm curious, at what point did you decide to become an author? It all started at the very tender age of four. I had a boundless curiosity for knowledge. My mother encouraged me to read 20 books a day and then write a book report. Soon reading wow. and reading stories became my hobby, giving me the passion to pursue authorship. I began to create short self-written stories of my own on our family computer. I'll write a story and give it to my mom as a gift. And she highly supported me and kept my sketches secured. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. Since the age of four, look at you now. That's awesome. Um, with being a young author, um, with writing, are you energized or exhausted by it? What are things that come up for you? It mostly energizes me because it's something I love to do. I can express my feelings, emotions, and creativity in the story. But however, the process of visualizing scenes in my mind before writing can be tiring for me at some times. So when I get a writer's block, I take a break and go for a walk. Thank you for the, uh, your tr transparency and for um, sharing about what ways work for you, you know, and uh, that when you experience writer's block, um, which is the other end of the energy that you experience um, when writing. Um, lastly, 
uh, in regards to being an author, at what point do you think that someone can call themselves an author? At every given stage in life, you can be called an author. Although individuals of any age can participate in writing, it's very crucial to acknowledge that not all writers possess the credentials or acknowledgement to be classified as authors. Authors are recognized as the originators of ideas and content in the written work they publish. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that perspective of yours. Um, Going now into more of the mentorship, I am curious um, for both of you, um, Dr. Conti and Jenny D, uh, what resources or tools do you recommend for someone that is seeking mentorship? I would say uh, part of this process and how I also do it in general terms is that uh, for you to be a mentor, or the process of mentorship, you need to love it. And it's something you need to love to do because otherwise you'll get burnt out and um, and you also need to be able to understand what it takes, you know. It takes patience, it takes time to mentor someone. And um, there are times when I meet outside of my walk window with uh, Genevieve to just process information and talk about things and uh, long conversations. You know, tell me the excitement of our stories. It takes a good listener. You know, some of the, those are some of the tools as well. A very good listener. And also, I would say flexibility. You know, a mentor has to be someone who is flexible and willing to meet someone where they are. And um, also to learn about the learning styles, you know, to understand the learning styles of the individual. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, when I recognized the skills, the knowledge and expertise that Genevieve is, was not sure at a very early you know, age and uh, in 2023, last January. So I said, you know what? I'm going to trust her with a computer to see how this expands. And, um, and then it just blew out. By the time you know it, by July of last year, she published her first book and then five others already written and uh, waiting to be published. So it's a process wherein I created an environment of learning and stability and ability and willingness to just listen and um, and entertain her ideas and process she's going through. And also a mentor should be someone who um, should also count themselves to be lucky to have somebody who is willing to work with them. In other words, a mentee coming from their own perspective uh, is, is someone looking for support, ideas, help. And uh, for you to be a mentor, you know, you would count yourself as being lucky to have someone who is coming to you to actually look for that kind of support. So I, I find myself in that situation of luck, if you like, wherein I get to actually serve the role of like, oh, I didn't know someone is looking up to me. Now I can harness this process and provide environment to see how it works. So those are some of the ways I uh, provide mentorship, the tools. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a really um, insightful perspective as a mentor. Thank you for that. Did you have anything else to add um, in regards to uh, what resources would you be recommending for someone that um, is seeking mentorship, Genevieve? So finding a good mentor, you have to trust someone, like trust someone in order to acquire them as a mentor. And, and also they have to be someone you know that is a very good learner in Dr. Conte's perspective. And also they need to, you know, respect, okay. you have to respect your, you have to respect their guidance. You have to actually have a good attitude towards them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that trust and respect. Thank you. Um, and now I want to ask both of you, what does it mean to be a mentor or mentor? Who would like to go first? Let Jenny Boone go first. Okay. What does it mean so to be a mentor? So I believe that the mentee's input holds significant weight in the mentee-mentor relationship. 
Unlike the teacher-student relationship, which places greater emphasis on the teacher's role in delivering effective instructions. Thank you. What about you, Dr. Fonsi? Well, thank you, I, I do believe that uh, my role as a mentor, one of the things that really I value is being a good listener and um, just sitting there and um, having the empathic listening skills as to um, understanding where Genevieve is coming from. And this could be general as well when I mentor um, folks doing research, which is another part of my passion, research mentorship, and um, just understanding what the learner needs. And I integrate um, the different learning styles. For example, um, I want to know what the mentee is all about in terms of are they auditory learner or are they visual or are they, you know, kinesthetic? You know, of course, as research shows that um, over 50% of the population is uh, kinesthetic, are kinesthetic learners, you know, social affective learners. And um, so I always would like to know what are the primary learning styles of the, of the mentee, you know, the individual. Once I know that, then I begin to also integrate my own philosophy of mentorship, which is um, I would use a terminology and which I really, really believe in because I come from a collectivist society by one of my mentors, myself, uh, Dr. Abdul Bangura, who is the president of the African Research, African Studies and Research Forum. Uh, typically, we talk about how um, Ubuntu, the, the, the philosophy of Ubuntu. So he came up with this uh, philosophy of Ubuntuology. Ubuntuology meaning that, you know, the process of how you mentor from a collectivist perspective, you know, because of who we are, so we support each other in a collectivist environment. I am because we are, you know, uh, notion of mentoring. And with that perspective, I use it, uh, use it as to when I work with uh, Genevieve as well, to understand uh, what are some of the areas that she wants to develop. And, um, and I come from a community perspective wherein just me understanding the culture from which we come from, me being an immigrant and also being a, a black immigrant educated person in the US and some of the barriers it took for me to get to where I am and, and seeing a young educated woman like Genevieve, uh, you know, aspiring to be what she wants to be. And so I created the opportunity of um, understanding that, you know, I am because we are. And uh, so therefore helping other young girls or young, young folks uh, to also support them and to create a platform for them to also um, have their voices and increase their expertise and expand on their knowledge. And it's a spiritual process as well, uh, spiritual in the sense creating trust between mentor and mentee is a very powerful process because uh, when the two really click, as people say, when you actually have that collaborative process, that trust process uh, built, really well built, it, it not just growth, it, it creates performance and it creates productivity. And I strongly believe in that. So that's the spiritual element of it. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Genevieve and Dr. Conti uh, for highlighting the factors that are important to uh, each of you individually and especially in the mentorship role that you both have. Um, Genevieve, I'm curious, how long does it take for you to write a book? You've written five, did I write books or was it six? Huh? Can you repeat? Um, oh, I was curious, how long does it take for you to write a book? It takes me four to five weeks, depending on my type of genre and research, but I don't usually take into consideration the publishing, editing, and illustrations. Mm -hmm. I see. That's, well, there's more things to that. Okay. Uh, what inspired you to write The Night of the Soldiers? When we started learning about World War II in fourth grade, I got really interested in the topic, and I thought that would be a great idea for a book. So I thoroughly did my research, and then I started drafting scenes for my book in my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I see, I'm looking at the chat, and it looks like Sue has a question. Sue, would you like to um, ask a question yourself? I can also read it. Sure. Mostly, I'd just love to hear more about these different books. They're such a great, intriguing title. So would you be willing to tell us a little bit about each one? Yep. 
Of course. So the first book, Within the Reach of Freedom, is a narrative about um, a young Black girl experiencing the March on Washington in 1963, I think. So she joined, She and her family joined thousands of other people to, in order to protest for equal rights and jobs freedom. She soon realizes that she has to step up as a Black girl herself. Oh. Wanna talk about the other books? Then Talk on Tuesday is narrative about a girl experiencing 9-11. But the main reason why I actually chose to write that book is because I, I felt deep for all the losses of lives on 9-11. And I wanted to express my gratitude for the heroes and the people who, who died during that event as a memorial. So I wrote that book and I'm planning on getting it published as a memorial. Right. Um, what about the, um, the, the other one, uh, Where Our Heroes? Is it, which one did you talk about? Is it the attack on Tuesday or Where Our Heroes Lie? I think the next one. Well, Where Our Heroes Lie is in perspective of a soldier going to war. He faces the hardships of having to leave behind his family and go fight in war. And it's scary at some times. Also, I dedicate this book to all soldiers and veterans. Awesome. And the wonders of the periodic table. Looks like this is like one of your textbook style, like textbook reading style. You want to talk about it? So, so when I was eight, I was eight years old when my mom started teaching me the periodic table, but I couldn't quite understand it the way we were supposed to learn it. So I decided that I could use poetry or rhyming to help me. So and then I figured poetry and science have a bond because, you know, I get rhymes stuck in my head often. Does anyone do? And, and I could, I figure out that putting the elements in poem form can help a lot. And now I can, I memorize the first 20 elements of the periodic table. And finally, the middle school drama series. So when it comes to middle school, there's lots of drama, honestly. You know, some few, some alumni, some alumni from my school, elementary school, you know, they tell me about middle school, how it's dramatic, and I get it. Some, and as a fifth grader myself, the years about the school year is about to end, and I get worried about middle school. But on the bright side, I look at all the funny things that might happen. You know, I'm in for some drama. That is awesome. You couldn't stop all of us from smiling and giggling. <laughs> yep, I love making people laugh. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit of. Um, you know, the context of the books that you have upcoming, I'm really I'm not now more excited the more I care about it. So it looks like there's a lot of variety in terms of stories and the formatting, which I think is really cool as a writer to, you know, expand um, with uh, the, uh, the material that you work with. Um, I see here, uh, it looks like we have another question. Um, Dr. David, did you want to ask question yourself? Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm really enjoying uh, the conversation presentation. So thank you to both of our guests. But uh, Dr. Conte, I, I wondered if you could speak more about how you be how this relationship came about with you and Genevieve, how you became her mentor, maybe uh, also 
uh, if you could speak about your interest in mentoring uh, and being a mentor and, and the importance of uh, mentoring for BIPOC youth. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. I, I've known Genevieve ever since she was born and um, uh, her family, her parents are from Sierra Leone, where I am from as well. And so we are we live in an immigrant community where, you know, people connect and and uh, so I know her family. And um, and so from there, we have been having these conversations when she was like maybe three, four years old, started talking and walking and reading. And uh, she developed a great passion of reading. I mean, as she said, her mom would encourage her to read tons of books. I mean, the, even the librarians, yes, her local library knows her. <laughs> and um, so it's, you know, for me, I started seeing how she was growing as a young lady, you know, having this passion of, you know, knowledge and, and writing. And so that's how I came in. And in my community as well, in the Sierra Leone community or in the immigrant community in general, I'm very keen at identifying uh, folks that um, have a passion for what they want to do. You know, and uh, I have these conversations with, you know, families and parents wherein they, you know, they they introduce their kids and, and I have these conversations around what do you want to do when you grow up and how do you want to do it? Do you know what some professions out there that you may be thinking about? And every now and then I just come across somebody like Genevieve that knows what she wants to do. And um, I'm going to just uh, spoil the show here to tell you what she, I think she wants to be, what is it, an aer aeronautic engineer? Is that is that correct, Genevieve? Correct me if that's wrong. It's aeronautic air engineer. Aeronautic engineer that she wants to be, and uh, how many nine year, ten years, ten year old kids, you know, youths out there would you find? I would say this is what I want to be, and um, and she's excellent in mathematics. I'm not kidding. Uh, she might be getting closer to calculus right now, and um, and, and all the sciences as you as you heard her talk about uh, in her experience with the periodic table. You know, when so many youths out there are, you know, probably thinking about buying tours and she's talking about periodic table. And then you go, what? She even knows the first 20 elements. She didn't get to that part. But uh, <laughs> and uh, so I use the opportunity to identify, you know, whatever opportunities I could, whether a youth is, you know, excellent or a youth is struggling in whatever capacity for me to uh, come in and uh, provide an environment of support and safety and and ensure that uh, they grow and nurture their skills, which is also something I do even in my current position as a clinical mental health counselor and uh, professor, wherein I I tend to look at students in my classroom and, and just know sometimes exactly where they are going with certain things. Like for example, I teach a research course where students do a presentation of some kind where they act, actually do a research proposal. And, and every summer, every quarter, I encourage them to, to submit it for a conference presentation. You know, like, hey, you already got this proposal done. And if I approve it already, uh, it's good for a conference proposal. Just go ahead, submit. And uh, so every now and then I see them show up in uh, certain conferences or uh, there is a popular one in our department, which is uh, the Social Justice Symposium, which happens every year. So hopefully I can see some, some of my students from my classes, you know, submit their proposals because they're already done in the classroom. So it's just a matter of submitting that. So recognizing those tools and talents and people, you know, folks' opportunities, uh, it's just a joy that I find so that you know, it also cuts the anxiety and, and and can I do this or maybe not, you know, provide a platform for um, for everyone to succeed. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I always have more questions though. So if we run out, I got more. Awesome, that would be great. Um, that, thank you for sharing that, um, Dr. Conti. Definitely support and encouragement goes a long way. As a student myself and as a mentee, that really is uh, something that helps us, you know, grow into uh, the areas that, that we want to um, excel in. So I appreciate that. Um, I see in the chat here, Sue Byers has a question for Genevieve. Sue, would you like to ask? Thank you, Nabi. Hi, Genevieve. It's a pleasure Hi. to meet you. Same. Thank you. 
I am intrigued um, and would love if you wouldn't mind giving us just a bit of insider knowledge about um, an example of your rhyming of the periodic table. And that, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, often when you, when one is so accomplished, even though you are a mentee, you become a mentor. Others look to you to become a mentor for them. How has that worked out for you? So I will start with answering the second question first. So many people ask me to mentor them and, and then like getting men, mentee by a very good mentor it gives me like it give he gives off the skills that a good mentor will use in order to become a mentor myself. And also, Bon. That's great, and and so you don't shy away from that if someone asks if you can help them. No, I don't shy away from that because I know if I got a good mentor, I know the skills of a good mentor and that could help me to be a mentor myself. Yeah, that's wonderful. And encourage some others. Do you want to talk about maybe a little bit expanded, uh, talk about uh, the work you're doing in the community, community service, Genevieve, with uh, the youth, the, the shelter of soul or the yep. home? Also, I help at a uh, home, uh, family shelter. I te I mentor there. I help them with the homework and explain it to them. That is outstanding. Thank you. And then, can you give us just a bit of a sample of your rhyming of the periodic table? So, um, I made this poem about a year ago. So it's not really good, but it's fine. So. It's like I was I was using my imagination and writing about how the elements were playing hide and seek. And then I used examples of where the elements are usually found. So for example, I found hydrogen and rock kept propulsion, and then I found helium hiding in balloons. I know where I'll find lithium very soon. There he is hiding in a battery. Where is beryllium? Oh, where did you go? Oh, I found him in my mirror. Some other elements wanted to play, so I had this, so they found, had to find out where to stay. Boron and fiberglass, carbon in the air, nitrogen, freezing stuff, and oxygen in our lungs. I wish you were around when I was learning the periodic table. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Same here. I wish the same too. That would have really helped me. That was a really uh, beautiful um, part. So thank you so much for sharing that, Cindy. And um, to hear about um, the things that you're doing in your community. Um, I see on here, um, Ayo Sipman has a question. Would you like to uh, ask yourself or I can also read it? Um, I can ask. Uh, hi, Genevieve. I'm EO. It's very nice to meet you. I'm super inspired by everything that you've accomplished. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering if you have any favorite authors. Um, and then I have a second question after that. So I do. One of my favorite authors was is Rick Warden and Ronald Dahl. Like Ronald Dahl's Bunnies are really story and Rick Rordan's Rick Rordan's books like gives me on the edge of my seat. Gets yeah. me on the edge of my seat. That's awesome. I remember reading both of those, so that's really cool. Um and I'm also curious if you have any interest right now that you're thinking about maybe writing about next. Um I'm thinking about writing about how how good it is to have a mom, a very, my very ego mother is based off on my mom, my own mom in general. That's so sweet. 
I'm planning on naming it my very eagle mother. <laughs> How come? <laughs> because she always looks out for me. And also, she helps me, too, very much. That's so sweet. Do you think you'd ever write a book about your mentor? Yep. 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 It's really cool. Thank you for answering my questions, Genevieve. You're welcome. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, the next question um, that I'm thinking about in terms of mentorship, I'm curious uh, from both of your experiences, Dr. Conti and Genevieve, what makes a successful mentorship and how do you measure impact? In my experience, um, it's um, being a successful, uh, to make a successful mentorship, it has to uh, me understand that not everyone is going to be excellent because I can't have these expectations just because I, I know who I am and how I do things. So, uh, you know, I, I have to give people a break and I clearly understand that, that not everybody is going to be excellent. It's almost like uh, there are times when there are A students, there are B students, there are C students, right? So I look at it from that angle where, you know, everybody needs uh, something to um, to enhance their skills. Some people already got it. Some people are excellent. You know, some people might need a little hand-holding or a little push or motivation. And, um, you know, sometimes some people even get failing grades, for example. So I look at it from that perspective of teaching and how do you nurture someone from even when somebody is not motivated to do something, even when somebody is having failing grades, but how do, I, how do I step in as a mentor to support that? So measuring that impact comes along with understanding that not everyone is going to be excellent, but even the minor steps, even the little step, even if somebody could make one step from a, a D to a C, that is still okay. You know, I, I can't put the pressure to say, okay, because your grade is D, therefore now you have to walk towards A. It's 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 scaffolding experience. I have to pay attention to how much scaffolding happens over time. And so with that, you know, measuring impact is not so much a successful uh, mentorship. I try not to use my own scale and worldview of how I perceive myself because I can make myself very much, you know, self-discipline wherein I have to sit down in the middle of the night and write a research paper. I hold myself accountable. But not every mentee can do that. Some people wouldn't be able to. They want to sleep. And, and so I recognize all of those things. And I recognize the barriers that people may have um, while I'm doing the mentoring thing. So wherein sometimes people don't have the resources. Sometimes people don't have um, enough uh, tools to, to be able to actually excel or do better. And, and I look for those things and I look for those barriers. I look for what they need. Thank you for sharing that. It sounds like, you know, you value um, seeing the reality of that person. If they were your, your mentor or student, um, because people have different circumstances. So uh, I think that's a really great foundation to have. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Thompson. You have anything to add then please? So that question, it's um, what makes a successful mentorship and how do you measure its impact as a mentee? So mentorship comes with a lot of trust. We have to respect our mentor's guidance as well as incorporate ideas and perspectives through listening and learning. And also as a mentee, you have to ask more questions and seek clarification. Also co consist community communication between ment mentee and mentor in order to get updated on things I need to work on as a mentee. Trust and communication, yeah, definitely. When, as you talk about communication and like, yeah, I remember the famous phrase, communication is key. And so, yeah, thank you for highlighting that, Genevieve. I'm, oh, it looks like Sarabeth has raised her hand. Go ahead, Sarabeth. Thank you, Genevieve. I'm so impressed with your, uh, with all your accomplishments, but more about how you talk about them. And I think that I could totally see your periodic table 
poetry go viral. It, it's really exciting. That's very cool. I noticed that you chose some really challenging topics and you seem so brave to me to do that. And I wonder if there are some tips that you have for people who are looking at difficult topics. How did, how did you hold all of that difficult stuff about 9-11 and the war? And, and what, what was it that, that helped you push through and write your stories? So I, it's based on the research. You have, I, before discovering these topics, I had to do lots of research on them in order, it's like, if it was an interesting topic, I will surely write about it. And it depends, like the type of research, it, one time it took me two months to do of research in order to get a book. Mm -hmm. And also, one tip I will recommend is that you have to be really interested in the topic because if you're not interested in the topic, that will make you want to just lay back on doing the research about it. And It sounds great. It sounds like you're saying two things. Give yourself more time if you need it. And also, if you like for 9-11, I actually went to New York and saw the monument. And then I just saw all the names of the people. I was like, oh, my God, that is a lot of people who died. And I actually felt really sad. And I decided to write a book that inspired me. So to con in conclusion, you need a lot of research and an inspiration in order to create a book on a hard topic. Love that. Thank you so much. I love your tips. You're welcome. They seem to fit for us here, too. I think John could attest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Beth, for that question. Um, I agree. Thank you, Genevieve, for the perspective you shared. Um, again, you know, I'm curious a lot about the mentorship I as a mentee myself, I've definitely benefited from mentorship relationships that I've had. Um, and so I'm curious for both of you again, Dr. Constantine Genevieve, how do you track the balance between respecting, you know, the mentor's guidance and at the same time incorporating their ideas and perspective? All right, I'll let Genevieve go first. I respect my mentor's guidance as well as incorporate my ideas and perspectives through listening and learning from my mentor with an open mind and a positive attitude. I ask questions and seek clarification. I'm also open to helpful feedback and ideas. Furthermore, I adapt my learning to align with my personal needs, preferences, and circumstances. I base my decisions on my personal comprehension, creativity, and intuition. Finally, I maintain consistent communication with my mentor, providing updates on my advancements, accomplishments, and obstacles. Additionally, I express my thoughts, ideas, and feedbacks without the fear of disagreement. Absolutely. As you've already had Jennifer express it, this is what we go through with the mentoring process, wherein I give her the platform to express herself and um, and see what she comes up with. And along the way, I get to, you know, walk with her as to, uh, you know, brushing up on a few things that provide feedback and she provides her own thoughts about it. And uh, it's a very expressive process where she lets me know how the feedback looks like and um, and I let her know how, you know, on the other professional expertise part of it, how things might look like. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's an emerging, really collaborative process that we have that consistently we continue to improve and thrive on so that uh, to ensure that uh, we get to where we need to be. And um, I listen to her and I listen to her stories, her ideas, and patiently and carefully and, um, and create a way of molding them into uh, a supportive environment for her to continue to expand. 
So I literally, sometimes I just take the back seat and, uh, and let her take the forefront. And as you all have seen exactly what I've been doing here, some questions I just say, I like Jenny, we'll go first. And uh, because I want her to take the bold step. And sometimes when you find mentees that have motivation to do what they do, and, and it just, it makes it easier actually on you, the mentor, where like, I know you got this, you know, you take this first step and then we brush up on things that we have to work on. So it's a listening collaborative process that really works for both of us. And um, I appreciate that. And I feel honored to always work with her. A lot of respect for a young scholar. I agree, truly, that was evident in um, uh, just the past 50 minutes here. So thank you. Um, I, another question that I have is that, are there any specific goals or objectives that um, you both uh, set uh, in regards to tracking process? So usually I use the SMART goals progress. progress, which means I try to be, so in general, SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So that means I try to be more specific with the kind of genre I'm writing about. And I measure the length of the manuscript and the time I need to devote to it. That determines if it's attainable. Also, my story has to have relevance. And I can easily tell because I'm an avid reader and I know what makes a good story compelling. For example, it took me one week to write The Night of the Soldiers, but what took longer were the illustrations and publishing. There are times when I write a book in six weeks in order to reach my goal. Absolutely, and if I can add something more there, it's exactly as uh, Jenny Reeve has uh, presented. The Night of the Soldiers was written in a week. I mean, really quick. Within a week, it was done. And so the writing of it was so exceptional to the extent I, when I saw the manuscript, I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is impressive. So, and then I, you know, I here and there provided suggestions and how the characters look like and, and tell me more about this character or, you know, expand more about this uh, without doing any single piece of any writing. I'm just asking questions just for her to expand and in thought provoking questions for her to, to see how far she can actually expand her knowledge. And it became a very, very empowering process. So as she has already explained about the SMART goal, she knows what she's about to do. And she knows when she wants to finish the book. I'm just uh, providing an environment for her to get there using the SMART goals. Awesome, that is really great to hear. And again, um, the Night of the Soldiers, I have um, added into the chat if anybody would like to um, get a copy of the book. It looks like there is an audio book. Is there an ebook as well, Genevieve? Or is it a hard copy and audio book? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a hard copy. There's an audio uh, in Amazon. Okay, thank you for sharing that. It looks like Dr. David raised his hand. Go ahead, Dr. Politely raised my hand. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, really enjoying this conversation. Um, I, I, I want to come back to you for a second, Dr. Conte. Um, so I think most of us at Antioch are are pretty aware of the racial inequalities in education for youth, especially, and uh, that, 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 you know, in, in this nation broadly. And so clearly mentoring uh, those youth uh, has an important role, I think, that's what I'm hearing you say, in response to those kinds of inequalities. And, and then earlier you spoke of uh, coming to your mentoring from a collectivist perspective. And I wonder if you could just unpack that a little bit for us and help us understand that in the context of these inequities in education that we see. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for that uh, question. So uh, in my collectivist uh, worldview, uh, you know, you don't necessarily do things on your own. In other words, you know, the, your success and your productivity uh, should be also a shared responsibility of your community. And uh, it's also because everybody at some point in time has contributed to your success, you know, no matter how minute or no matter what it is. And so from that collectivist lens and given what I practice is that when I am doing uh, mentoring, I look at it as to how do I reach the extensive number of youths or how do I reach a community? And sometimes I give talks in communities about how to do certain things or how to follow certain careers. And I've been invited to certain places where sometimes in churches or sometimes in local communities where I give these conversations about how do we support our youths and how do we provide a platform or how do we provide um, ways to eliminate or limit the barriers that we need to uh, overcome. So it, it's a very, very uh, methodical process that I don't want to be alone being the successful one in my community. And because I don't want to be alone, I also look at it as to I have to give back to the community. But giving back has to do with reaching as many people as I can within the collectivist framework. And also, I want to bring along as many people as I want to, as I could, uh, because I don't want to be on the platform by myself. And, and so being here with Genevieve, um, I am going to continue to do it, wherein I I literally would like to be there, but she owns the voice and she is going out there as well to support other youths in the community, doing homework assignments and, um, and also doing other community services, wherein, because the, the idea is you don't want to do it alone by yourself. You don't want to have all the success. You also want to bring along people. So it's a journey wherein all of us work together. So that's the framework right there. Hence, uh, what I said earlier about Ubuntuology, Ubuntu. So that uh, we all get to live together with a successful moment. And not everybody has to get there. Not everybody is clearly excellent, but we can still walk along. And some folks can pick up cues as to how to get there from others. And that's the essence of the collectivist framework. That was a beautiful um, explanation to that, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. The image that was coming up for me is like one person is there and just looking around them, you know, just smiling and kind of rooting for them um, because, yeah, you don't want to be alone. You want the same thing um, for other people. And I think that's a beautiful um, perspective to have moving forward. Um, we are about to hit our five five o'clock mark, and so I want to remind uh, everyone that feel free to leave if we need to, but um, we'll still stay for a little bit to kind of um, hang around with Dr. Conti and Genevieve. Genevieve, um, um, because I focus more on the questions, there are a lot of um, um, messages here on here um, from folks that have, um, you know, uh, that have uh, the message for you and Dr. Conti. So feel free to take a look and I can also kind of see you later as well. Um, and we're open for any other questions or comments. Uh, feel free to do that. I see on here she is saying thank you uh, so very much, Genevieve and Dr. Conti, for an outstanding presentation. And he said, thank you for taking 2024 with such creativity and inspiration. From Natalia Tucker, massive well done to Jenny's mom for keeping her focused. Yes. Hi there. Um, then you small if you'd like to say hi or introduce yourself a little bit. Um, thank you. You're right. <laughs> Hello. Hello there. Thank you. Hi, Musu. Hi, Nabi. Thank you for helping Genevieve with all of this. You're welcome. And I don't want to 
say it wrongly again. I will. Is that correct? I will Oh, me? Correct? EO. Yes. EO. EO. Thank you so much. And we are um, inspiring and we can't wait to read all of your work. Keep it up. And thank you, Dr. Conti, for guiding such a bright young woman and talking to us about your work. Uh, definitely. Mara Power said, Thank you, Genji, Dr. Conti, Navi, and all participants for this wonderful, inspiring, free moving conversation. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the platform, and thank you, Antioch University and the Messi Conversation team, and for bringing us here. We appreciate that. I, I very much appreciate for all of the audience. Antioch University and Navi and her team for the opportunity to be interviewed on this platform today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time and flexibility, Genevieve, Dr. Conti, and Mosley. I truly um, appreciate working with you and it's really honored to hear the perspective from uh, both of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other chat or questions. Oh, Dennis first. I thank you all. So brilliant and helpful. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, in terms of questions, it looks like I'm not seeing any. And so um, I feel like this is a good time to conclude our uh, messy conversation event. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming in again. Thank you, Genji, Dr. Fonti, and Yusu, and the rest of the message conversations coming to me and our audience for coming today. Have a great rest of the week. You too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Not be. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Jennifer. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>